because of the following CBS News special report, the program normally seen at this time will not be presented today. My first recollection is just watching uh, the news as a kid. There was a uh, broadcast on uh, television about Vietnam and that Marines had landed there and I had no idea that there was such a place called Vietnam. The war was going on, but I didn't really pay a lot of attention to it. Whatever our purposes were, we were going to go in and do and get out, and I wasn't much concerned about it. If you think every United States Marine learns how to handle a rifle, you're right. I grew up right, reading a lot of Kipling and wanted, to <laughs> wanted some adventure. But if you think that's all he learns, you're wrong. With American air support, South Vietnamese troops are still engaged in the endless, weary, bloody business of war. And I didn't really know much about it until about around 64, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, and I watched the famous uh, Johnson speech. The confrontation between the Reds and the West was the most critical since the Gulf of Tonkin incident last summer, when the U.S. replied just as swiftly to North Vietnam PT boat attacks. I wasn't much concerned about it until my brother was sent to Vietnam. In 1967, I found myself uh, with the set of papers that said I was now going to be joining the Army. I think the first time I heard about Vietnam was uh, in boot camp in the Marine Corps. But the drill instructors inured us to the fact that we were all going to go to Vietnam. I remember one of the teachers one day, and I think in social studies, he was started screaming at him. He said, some of you are going to end up in a rice paddy in Vietnam. And, uh, you know, as a senior in high school, I thought, you know, where's Vietnam and why would I want to be in a rice paddy? You might go for your first tour and get back okay, but not as many people uh, went for their second tour and came back. On the first day of school the next term, which was September, my junior year, a priest by the name of Father uh, Barry Jones brought together the uh, dozen or so students that weren't doing very well in school. <laughs> and he uh, sat us down and told us how important it was to improve our grades and all this because there was this thing called the Vietnam War. And already uh, some of the classmates from that high school had come home killed in that war. I can't say that I'm scared to death, but I'm scared. I mean, after a while, you know it's gonna come. You can't do nothing about it. And you just look to God. It's about the only thing you can do. We were engaged in fighting. There were about 500 BC that had uh, attacked this 14-man patrol. The tree that I had dodged behind was hit with a rocket-propelled grenade. And I was walking point when uh, a grenade was thrown and hit me in the leg, bounced before I could do anything. That grenade went off, just lifted me off the ground, ripping me apart. Then this explosion right where I was, it knocked me unconscious. And when I woke up, all I remember was just hollering for the medics. Emergency medevac, ASAP. Chop through. I could tell that people were panicked about something and they were pointing back. And I walked deeper into the water. I was real tall and there were children in the river that were being swept away. Now our position is threatened. The patrol has been ambushed and is tied down. All of my buddies were in that, uh, that squad and we lost contact with them. I had 13 men when I came. And it's four days later now and how many are still here? Six. I'm losing too many men. We were stay here too much longer. We, we wouldn't have much left of this platoon, let alone the company. And nobody could find them, but you could hear them screaming. There's Dynamite 5 to uh, request dust off. We had some incoming helicopters coming in, and we had more body bags than we had people. Was shot twice, knocked to the ground again. I found myself withering in pain. Run through the stomach uh, by a North Vietnamese soldier with his bayonet while I was laying on the ground. And then about an hour later, it was daylight and we went back to that same area and waded down in there and um, uh, found um, a bunch of these little kids and they'd been swept into the Constantina wire and they had just been like in a blender, just churned up. That was a bad night. Uh, I knew I was gonna die on that field. And I can sort of remember just pulling parts of those kids out of that wire, just trying to get them out of the wire and just losing it, and uh, I, I never uh, 
never got over that. We just hadn't been around death that much. Uh, my company of 219 Marines walked into a 650-man Viet Cong ambush. And they um, took the brunt of the ambush and were pretty much annihilated. Only two survived. I still have visions of that, with the body bags. I even had visions of people moving in the body bags. Death is it's tough on a young guy. When youth was a soldier and I fought across the sea, we were young and cold hearts, a bloody savagery, born of indignation, children of our time. We were orphans of creation and dying in our prime. I never will forget my first nights in country in that every night was lit, lit up like uh, neon lights as the mortars and the flares were going off. It was very eerie feeling. And most of the first week that I spent here, we were attacked every night. Parts of this air base was under attack at all times. My first day was a quiet day because it was night, but the following morning I started seeing things and the commander uh, took me to the hospital. We got set up and we had some free time and the commander took me to, uh, th throughout the hospital and uh, saw some things that to this day bothers me. Well, guys in Echo Recon, I'm thinking about you up here. Thinking about you, Leonard and Bob Peterson, Brad Melcher, Dick Ness, Phil Roach, Danny Lamb, Charlie Tull, John Forshag, but I guess most of all, I think of Charlie Wilson and Hamick. They died on this hill. They're still here. And old Kenny Glenzer. Okay, Kenny, this shot's for you. Somewhere down that way, you stepped on that booby trap I told you to look out for. Thank God you made it home. We can laugh about it now, it wasn't funny then. I'll tell you straight up front, I'm uncomfortable talking about combat experience. My first day, they drop you off a plane, they open the door, it's 150 degrees. What hit me first was the, the humidity and these smells I never smelled before. The heat was, was a big thing, it was, it was really hot out there off the coast of Vietnam on the carrier. And we spent most of our time just moving through the jungles, uh, securing areas, seeking out what uh, we refer to as the enemy. And by the most part though, most of us uh, were just trying to stay alive. The North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong are still there and they will not go away until or unless politicians tell them to do so. First day walking up the trail, we got into it, and there was a lot of firing going on. There's snipers in the trees and all that, and the guy in front of me got shot, the guy behind me got shot. People knew that when they saw someone coming to the home in a uniform, it was not good news. Uh, my best friend uh, that I'd gone through training with was killed standing next to me. They didn't have no life. They didn't get a chance to join nothing. That dreaded day came when my mother saw a man in a uniform walk up her sidewalk. The reality check is that, uh, you know, as an 18-year-old Marine, I was not bulletproof. Well, she received a notification that Floyd had been shot down. That's when I first realized, because it was relatively new in my arrival to Vietnam within about the first month or so, that this was real, that it was no game. It appeared that the plane had exploded in the air and there could not have been survivors. A lot of them were there because they didn't want to be there. They got put there. Whether or not I'll ever see them again, I still don't know. If we don't get some more people up in this area real quick, and we don't get some more B-52s real fast, then these people are going to be all the way down to Da Nang before anybody knows it. Does everybody agree with that? 100%. Just an incredible amount of frustration which led to anger. 
You just wonder, what in the world are we doing here and how we're doing this? The Pentagon gives orders to the generals, and the generals give order to the colonels, and so on, and all the orders are obeyed. But the grunts don't seem to understand that they're holding Con Tien because of a Pentagon decision to win the war with a kind of modern Maginot line that hasn't been built yet. I have a real resentment for politicians who put servicemen in harm's way for political reasons. One of the most frustrating aspects of serving there was the pilots risked their lives. I had the job of briefing them where they were going, the target, what their ordinance were, you know, how they were going in, how they're coming out, what to do if they got shot up and had to eject. I think it was very frustrating for me to know that sometimes they went on these missions where it just didn't make any sense. Our targets often were chosen from Washington, D.C. and relayed to the captain of our ship, to the Admiral of the 7th Fleet, who was on our ship. We had a pilot in our squadron who actually quit, uh, was over the beach, uh, had five or six uh, SAM missiles shot at him over a worthless target in Laos, came back. He was covered in sweat. It was like he just got out of the ocean or jumped into a pool and stood out. He was so, so full of sweat from maneuvering and dodging those missiles. And he came in and he took the Velcro strip, his wings off his suit, slammed it down on the counter and said, I quit. I think that people in our society have a very warped understanding of what war is all about, um, how it comes into existence, how it's fought, and what the after effects of war are. I mean, no one goes to war that they come back the same person. It just doesn't happen. Just the adrenaline rush of, of, of combat, of war. It's a very um, emotional experience that it's like a drug that when it gets inside of you, it's, it's hard to um, let go of it. It just always felt like unfinished business. To me, Vietnam personally felt unfinished. A lot of people struggle with Vietnam, particularly the vets who serve there. So many are stuck in the past and, and they have uh, so many terrible memories. I was kind of in a emotional, psychological wilderness of uh, um, not understanding PTSD, not understanding survivor's guilt. I was proud of serving my country, being a Marine, and, and uh, so I wore that mask for about four and a half years, and, and, uh, but unfortunately my life began to unravel. Several years after I was home from Vietnam, did the typical thing, kind of spent a decade self-medicating, and I never regretted going. I never really felt guilty about being a Vietnam veteran. There was just something in my own soul that felt unfinished uh, about my Vietnam experience. I couldn't shake the fact that I needed to be um, responsible in some way to help correct um, what war does. And I just always felt in my heart, if I ever could go back to Vietnam, it would be meaningful and important, and I didn't know what that was. I just had this, this concept of, of um, humanitarian work and war. And it's interesting when I've asked veterans, friends of mine, if they want to go back, there's no middle ground. Vets go to Vietnam with Vets with a Mission. They meet their former enemy. They meet the people. And reconciliation comes full circle from the terrible memories of 1968 or 1969 to discovering the war is really over. Some of the men that have come with us served in this very area during the war. Đây là một số các thành viên trong thời kỳ chiến tranh người ta đã phục vụ trong chiến đấu tại Việt Nam. We appreciate the opportunity to build new friendships and to heal the wounds of war. Tôi rất đánh giá rất là cao về cái. Even people who are diametrically opposed at some point can find a place where they agree and where they can become brothers and can make positive movement. How we're looking at here is the, is the bombed out church uh, that was bombed during the war. And uh, when the church was hit, there were 29 
people worshiping and they were all killed. And what that's what the mission is here is for is to rebuild the church. What you're looking at here is the crater that was made by the B-52 bomb that leveled the church. And they realized the war is over, not only there, but over inside. I was able to reconcile in my own heart and mind some guilt that I had. You become peaceful with them. You realize that Vietnam is a country, not a war. Yeah, this is ground that I walked on in 1969, early 69. But it's gone, it's all changed. I have seen reconciliation with former enemies where we have sat down at a table for dinner together, VC, NVA sitting on one side of the table, and a bunch of, bunch of us sitting on the other side of the table, just in our way that we can communicate through interpreters or through broken English or whatever, being able to talk to one another. We all had a mission, but now, quite frankly, we're just, just a bunch of old farts sitting there having a beer together and talking about the old days. It's always very tense when those dinners start, but 99.9% .9 of the time, the veterans on each side of that table, by the time that dinner is over, they've, they've got this special bond because men who would have never thought of talking to one another, talking about their families, talking about their children, talking about let's have a beer together, let's get in touch, let's keep in touch. And the reconciliation there is simply to get rid of your baggage from the war. And it's a very emotional time and reconciliation becomes real. So Vets with a Mission has always been about reconciling people to one another. And, and in this context, country to country, vet to vet. And I'm talking about Americans, South Vietnamese to Viet Cong, NVA. And I'm talking about a people of the Vietnam to the people of the United States. And most importantly, being reconciled to God. It was both a very natural, physical, draw, but yet at the same time I knew and understand that my faith was involved in it. It was just like a, a tremendous magnet that wanted to pull me back to Vietnam. It, I couldn't shake it, I couldn't resist it. When I became a Christian, I realized that my life really wasn't about me. It was about Jesus. It was about what the, the good book says. It was about what we're supposed to do as a Christian. I can tell you how I changed and when I changed, but I can't tell you what causes that. I think that's bigger than me and I don't understand. I feel truly blessed for being called. The scriptures teach us that we're supposed to clothe the naked, feed the hungry, to visit those in prison, and to minister to the sick. Practical helps. As my faith grew and I understand what it meant to be a servant, and that it was not about me, but it was about serving others and certainly being humble. I wasn't such a big deal. Christ was a big deal. I remember reading somewhere that God calls everyone, but not many answer. For some reason, I was receptive, I answered. That's what the mission has always been, low-key. We don't care if we get the big press and the big, uh, the big recognition, and we just do what we're supposed to. We go out to the rural parts of the country. We're not in the big cities. Uh, a lot of people in my specialty, that's where they end up. They work in a hospital. They do great things, doing surgical procedures. But out in the rural areas, you really see the poor people and the primitive uh, situation they live in. Uh, kids running around, you go inside the room, and it's, or they're, yeah, single room homes. They're, dirt floors, uh, they have little or nothing. I think it really touches your heart that you're really making a difference in their life. So this is a, a nine-year-old boy that this morning got bit by a centipede right before clinic and um, everything started to, to get highs. His eyelids are swelling and uh, he's not having any problems breathing yet. Uh, put a steroid shot in his arm a minute ago 
So what is all of the raised area? So um, hives are urticaria, which is a, just his whole body responding to the venom from the centipede. He'll do fine. He'll be all right. And sometimes I'll have this kid come in with club nails and, and they're cyanotic and I know full well they need heart surgery. And I'm the guy that can send them to the doctor and get it started and we can save that kid's life. So, I mean, that's priceless. The policy of Vets with a Mission is to screen patients. The money is available. The patient can't afford it. The patient wouldn't get the surgery. And it has to be a surgery that will drastically alter their life, giving the man the ability to hear, giving the woman the ability to see, giving the 18-year-old woman a chance to live. These people, if they don't get it repaired, they die. The Quezon Clinic had a death rate of childbirth of 33%. And in the first year after our clinic was opened, the death rate of newborn babies dropped to 3%. Going to the clinic, and I had this uh, very severe Down syndrome uh, child. Nick is 13 years old, and he came this morning. And uh, so immediately I was attracted to him because I have a son that has Down syndrome. He has a cataract over one eye and a heart defect. The lens of the eye is completely opaque. He can't see out of his left eye, so it's a simple procedure to remove the cataract and put a brand new lens in. And uh, here in Vietnam, the cost is probably less than $200. Well, it's five o'clock their time. We're seeing our last patients, and the last patient is a seven-year-old girl. Tim came downstairs with her and her mother and said, I doubt we can do much for Pat. And he handed me that prescription, and it was for a bottle cap type glasses, about plus 10 power. And he said, I know you ain't got anything. And I went over there, and there was a set of kids' glasses that were bottle caps, plus 10s, within very close to her prescription. I pulled those out, and I looked at them, and I ain't got no idea how them glasses got in there. And I put those glasses on that little girl. Her eyes were already a little large with the, with the eyewear, but they got huge. And she said something in Vietnamese to her mother, and her mother looked over at me and started crying. And my translator said, this child has never seen a mother. And she'd never seen anything except blurring it, pretty much light, dark, and blurry. You know, she could see leaves. She could see, she never seen stars. She never seen her daddy or, or her sisters and brothers. And if that ain't a miracle, there ain't never gonna be one. I sat there and cried with her mother. That woman, I believe she believed there's a God because she believed there ain't no way I, that her daughter was going to leave that clinic and be able to see how she saw. That life of that child and that family, and maybe that whole village when they, hear, when they heard the stories changed, changed me. That made it perfectly clear to me why, why I was sent. That's probably why I've, I've, I've come back so many times. Because I know, I know that every time we go back, we, we can make an impact. There's such great need. We can do so much with so little. I love working with the Vietnamese people. They're very kind, they're very gracious. They're incredibly appreciative, the little that we do for them. Vietnam, uh, in the early years, would accept items like uh, overstocks of prescription drugs and needed drugs. We would uh, bring drugs into the country. Because the organization's always been trusted by the Vietnamese authorities, they've allowed certain latitudes and s us to do certain things that maybe some other organizations haven't. And one of those was printing Bibles. I never thought I would have an opportunity to be involved in ministry. Never thought I'd have an opportunity to share my faith. Never thought I would see anything. And yet, for whatever reason, was given an opportunity to see an incredible sight. It is one of the defining moments of my life. I met Mr. Som, who was the president of the People's Committee, and we were having uh, dinner together with members of the People's Committee and a small group of us from um, Vets with a Mission. We shook hands, and Mr. Som had a wooden leg. I asked him if how he lost his leg, if he lost it in the war, and he said yes, that uh, he got shot by a machine gun. And I told the interpreter, I said, uh, would you tell Mr. Som that I was a machine gunner? 
the interpreter didn't want to do it. And, you know, it got real quiet and everybody got hushed and the Vietnamese around us, the interpreter know what was going on. And so I just, I said, tell him. And uh, so he told Mr. Som that, that I was a machine gunner and that I served in the Quezon Valley with the 9th Marines. And I looked over at Mr. Som and he smiled and kind of grinned a little bit. And, and then I told the in, interpreter, I, I said, uh, I'd like to tell Mr. Som that <clears throat> I might have been the one that shot his leg off, but I want Mr. Som to, to know and understand that um, the war is over. And at one time we, we could have been and probably were uh, former enemies and engaged in combat, but now we're here together, working together to improve the quality of, of health care for his, for his commune. And Mr. Song stood up and he shook my hand and Mr. Song hugged me <laughs> and we embraced each other. And that was the, a dynamic moment in, in my Vietnam experience with Vets with a Mission. So I encourage people, anytime I get a chance, I say, have you ever thought about going back to Vietnam and maybe trying to get just a little different view? Yeah, it doesn't look the same, does it? It's so frustrating. You want to get excited, you know, you want everybody to get excited. Look at this, I was there. Standing on top of the statue, looking at it in the surrounding valley. It's hard to tell if there was ever a fire base here. You can't tell where any of the guns were ever at. Looking at uh, Marble Mountain with Marine Spot. It's uh, very misty here, clouds are hanging low. This is the Vietnam I remember. I just want them to see that, hey, you know, let it be behind you. Bill was involved in a, a battle on the Mekong Delta where a number of the people in his outfit had been, had been killed. And Bill was still struggling with that. And while we were over there, he got a chance to go up the Mekong Delta and actually went to the spot where this ambush had taken place. And after he, he returned from the Mekong Delta, he called his wife and they had a conversation on the phone. And she said, you have just given me the, the four sweetest words I have ever heard from you. And he said, I just said three words. I said, I love you. She said, no, you said something else. You said, my war is over. My first trip uh, was to be involved with uh, teaching physicians how to use Microsoft Access as a form of medical record systems. But on that trip was my first opportunity to see what Vets with a Mission was accomplishing with our vets. To me, it was all about doing something in Vietnam for the Vietnamese. But there, were, there was one individual on our trip who had not had a night's sleep in 30 years since he left uh, the war. Uh, he had some real serious issues. His whole goal in going on this trip was to be sure to visit the field where his best friend died. And I'm sure he had tremendous survivor guilt. Of course, a lot of these veterans went home believing they had destroyed a country, believed they had destroyed a people. And instead, when he landed in, in Saigon and spent the first couple of days there, something inside of him healed. He slept like a baby for the first time in 30 years. He came away no longer really wanting to see where his friend was killed. He wanted to do something positive for the country, but he was relieved of the guilt that he had been carrying for decades that he had destroyed these people or destroyed this culture. And he hadn't. They're wonderful, they're beautiful people, they're <laughs> loving, they're fun, they're full of joy. And he walked back into that and said, then it's all okay, and he could sleep. And I had never known the therapeutic value of going back to country. I think it was my first team, which was 2008, uh, when we went to Hong Ha, and uh, the experience at the Floyd Olson Clinic, and, uh, and learning more about Floyd Olson through his family and friends, and that was an awesome experience. My grandmother called me in Houston and said, your brother has been shot down. My mother was just beside herself. She was so distraught she couldn't talk. Floyd was the commander of the aircraft. And in April of 1968, he went out on a mission to rescue a downed Marine helicopter. The um, report came to us that the plane probably exploded in the air. And there was no likelihood that anyone could have survived the crash. I still wear Floyd's uh, uh, bracelet to this day. I. Uh, 
I just admire the, the, uh, the people went that were not veterans, but were family members and friends and, and how they came to pay homage and pay respect and, uh, and look for answers. When there's no evidence whatsoever, you assume and yet you want to hope that maybe somehow, some way your loved one could still be alive. I pray every night that, that's, that we'll find those answers to what truly happened to Floyd. I received a phone call one day from a very close friend of my brother's, Dennis Ducey. Dennis called and said um, that, some, that he and some other friends of Floyd's had gone to the crash site and had searched for evidence. And in the process of doing this, they noticed that in this village, which was very near the crash, Hong Ha Village, there was absolutely no medical help for the people who lived there. They decided to build a medical clinic in, in honor or memory of my brother. As we went into the clinic to look at it, um, what's, what grabbed me, gripped me the most of anything was the fact that there was my brother's picture hanging on the wall with his testimony in English on one side and his testimony in Vietnamese on the other side of the picture. And I thought, isn't this incredible that in 1998, my brother's picture would hang on the wall of any structure in a communist country. Uh, he just uh, saw the uh, body and he, he knew for sure that is the uh, body of the helicopter. He's not an enemy, he's friend. So he believes us, uh, we are now friends, not enemies. You always ask, why would God allow this to happen? especially when everybody was praying for Floyd's safety. This really made me feel that Floyd's life was not lost in vain. There was some purpose to this, that God would use this for good. The guys that I've met with Vets with a Mission are just such a generous, loving, kind group of people and their, and their wives. And their heart for Vietnam is truly amazing. And especially considering that these were folks that they were fighting against and, and had very difficult experiences as 18, 19, 20 year olds. Uh, but their hearts are just so open to those folks. It makes me want to join with them and help them and help them to help the people of Vietnam. And, and we're doing it in the name of Christ. And I think we've accomplished that. I think the people that we serve, they know we're different, not just because we're helping, but I believe they see Christ in what we are seeking to do for them. We have shown them and proven to them that um, we meant good and that we had a purpose that was more than just winning a war. Uh, the purpose was to show them a side of our humanity that was honorable. We just always built up that track record that we did what we said we were going to do. And sometimes to the surprise of them because they, our projects got done quicker sometimes under budget, they were first class. I mean, some of our medical clinics and, and have become uh, prototypes for the uh, country. These people began to, one, see us as Americans in a different light, but we got to see them in a different light of just people helping people. And one of the greatest things is, I really believe that the Vietnamese began to, or what I hope the Vietnamese began to see was that my heart was to help them because of the things that people experienced in war and in difficulty and hardship, there needs to be almost a sense of coming to peace with yourself and with your own life. I finally uh, accounted for something. I, I amounted to something. I was, I was valuable in my life. My life meant something. And the work uh, that I've done uh, will leave a legacy. Regardless of my shortcomings, the failures in my life, uh, I've struggled being a father. I've struggled being a good husband. Uh, I've struggled in my career at times, but through this, I think I made a genuine difference. And that's what I hope people would remember about me and Vets with a Mission, that we made a difference, not only on this earth, but eternally. I have been touched greatly by seeing the healing that's occurred in the lives of those who have been there. I remember one time um, early on sitting across the table from a uh, no, former North Vietnamese colonel. In those early days they always ask us, when were you here, where were you at? 
As we were talking, I discovered that he was the, the commanding officer of a regiment of North Vietnamese regulars uh, that nearly wiped my company out and uh, were overrun. We, we, we fought for five days in this battle. You know, we had this awkward moment that he realized that I had lost friends and, um, and he was responsible. It was his men that nearly wiped us out. And, and so through the interpreter, he said, why, why are you doing this? Why are you coming back to my country? Why are you helping us? And I looked uh, at that colonel and I said, sir, uh, Jesus Christ has taken away all the pain and hurt that I experienced during my time in Vietnam. And because of that uh, love that God has for me, I can say, I love you and Jesus loves you. And our interpreter down at the end of the table started bawling. And so we had the Americans on one side of the table, we had the communists on the other, and all, everybody's looking down at the table saying, what did this Yankee imperialist say to our precious sister that she's sitting down there bawling? You know, a couple moments of silence and, and our interpreter just finally uh, stopped crying and she told the colonel what I said. And when she translated what I said, he looked across the table and his eyes were big and he just looked at me and then he stood up with his hands on the table and he came around the end of the conference table and he and I got up and and he looked up at me you know I'm six four and he's not and uh, you know he looked up and he just threw his arms around me and had tears just streaming down his eyes and I just hugged him and when we got done he looked our interpreter in and he and he and he said to her he said uh, tell him I've never had an enemy tell me before that he loved me that's what I hope you know 50 years from now that they'll remember those uh, acts of kindness acts of love where uh, you know we get beyond the war and that Vietnam is a nation and it's a people you know that God loves unconditionally it just transcends it transcends countries it transcends socioeconomic uh, barriers it's just been an honor to be part of this for, for 25 years. So I think this new generation of veterans uh, really can carry on what Vets with the Mission started, reconciling with former enemies. looks like a logo. Yeah, I kind of see it. 